you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you again this morning. Um, I'm going to speak to a handout. I'm not using uh, PowerPoint. So what I've been asked to do is to give you an update on the geopolitical landscape. I'm going to make a few introductory comments. Then I'm going to look at the state of war in the world, the state of conflicts. Then I want to look at the Australian region. And then I'm going to conclude with a few comments about the new world of technology which is opening up and which will also have a big impact on the politics and economics of the world. So let me start off then with an, int uh, an introduction. I guess the basic point I'll be arguing for the next 45 minutes is that there is a continuing pace of change that um, if we know we've, we've managed possibly to survive this great uh, economic crisis. I noticed the good news coming out of the United States in the last 24 hours. But my warning is that the pace of change is just going to continue to accelerate. Well, let's start off then with some of these new factors. Number one is that we're moving into the economic unknown. This is the first time that a China recession, or at least a lack of amazing growth, has had to be factored into our calculations. Um, as you know, in the old days, if we would have been talking about China in this building, we would have been talking about the threat from China. The red menace coming down from the north. Now we're hoping that we're going to see more of that red menace coming into Australia with their checkbooks. So it's been a remarkable transfer of uh, status of China from being um, an enemy to a trader. Secondly, we don't know how long it's going to take for national government relief packages to work. We do know that Barack Obama's measures are only having uh, a mixed result so far. And I'm sure you would have all been following the developments uh, since January with the new American president. Another uh, thing that we don't know is are we actually living through a massive turning point in history? You know, some people are arguing this is now the end of the American era. I'm going to come back to that point a little later. But some people are arguing that this is now the end of the American era. A whole new era is beginning to open up. If that is the case, what will be the source of China's new power? You see, if you go back to the 17th century, and one of the first of the modern superpowers was the Netherlands. So in the 17th century, the Dutch moved around the world, including, of course, uh, immediately to our north, taking over the uh, Spice Islands, present-day Indonesia. What was the source of Dutch power? It was wind power. So they had sailing ships, they had windmills, which enabled them to drown, uh, sorry, to drain, to drain the land of the Netherlands, um, and then get rid of all the water and uh, reveal the good farming land that was in fact in the Netherlands. But it was wind power that pushed the Dutch along to global prominence in the 17th century. In the 18th century, Britain came to power on coal and iron. Uh, it's always been said that Britain will always be rich. It's a land full of coal surrounded by a sea full of fish. So Britain then comes to power and takes over from the Dutch. And then in the 20th century, we get the rise of the United States on the back of the oil industry. The oil industry began exactly 150 years ago last month in the United States. It is in fact technically the second oil industry in the world. The first was the whaling industry, because we used to catch whales for getting their oil, and including here in Australia. Whaling was our first big industry when the Europeans settled in Sydney. Obviously we had convicts and law and order issues as an industry, we also had whaling. And so our first oil crisis was when we ran out of whales, but luckily in August of 1859, Drake uncovered oil in Pennsylvania in the United States. The, that original oil well is still there. It's a museum piece. 1859. And that oil industry has kept us going for 150 years. It's been the backbone of the American economy. The United States used to be the world's largest producer of oil in the world. It's still the number one consumer. It's no longer the number one producer. So that's the United States, riding on the back of oil. Well, the question for us now is that if it is to be China in the 21st century, where will its source of new 
power come from? It's clearly not just the question of having a large number of people. You know, if you were talking about having a large number of people, that would make Bangladesh a superpower, which obviously it's not. So it's got to be something more than just a large number of people. We don't know what will be China's new source of power. So by all means, let's speculate about China being the number one economy by 2050. But how are they going to do it? We don't know. Number two on the handout, I talk about the return of Asia rather than the rise of Asia. You know, a lot of people are talking about the rise of China and India as though it was something new. That's not right. In 1820, China accounted for 29% of the global economy. India had 16%. This is before the onset of the major British invasion of India. Therefore, in a sense, both countries are returning to their old positions. There's nothing new about what's going on with China and India today. That's why we built the Silk Road, running from Lisbon through to eastern China. We wanted to get the goods out of China. So for hundreds of years, China has always been important for the global economy. We then saw China have a bad period, 200 years. You know, when you've got a civilization that's 5,000 years old, 200 years of being off uh, target is not such a bad thing. And China is really now returning to its position of dominance. Also, it's worth bearing in mind that these new emerging markets as late developers are able to learn the lessons from the West technological developments. Communism is on the way out in China and Vietnam. Vietnam's interesting. It's doing well from international trade. It's the world's biggest exporter of pepper, the second largest coffee producer, the fourth largest timber uh, furniture manufacturer, and it's now the tenth largest ship builder. If you go to Vietnam nowadays, uh, you'll find that they've pretty well forgotten the war. You know that that bit of difficulty with the Americans has already slipped from public memory. And the Vietnamese now see themselves as an emerging economy. So keep an eye on Vietnam. I was there during the war. These are tough people. You never saw them complain about their wounds or their pain. They're tough. And they obviously think it's their turn now. What is interesting is that they have jumped over the copper age in telecommunications. They don't bother now with having telephone lines. Everybody has a mobile. So they've been able to leap over an era through which we had to pass, which is the copper lines for telephones. Many Asians now feel intuitively that it's their turn to do well. And many of the basic long-term indicators suggest that Asia is on track for rapid economic growth. What are the key factors? Rising expectations. The belief that it is our turn now. A hundred years ago, Indian racetracks used to have warning signs, allegedly, saying no dogs or Indians allowed. The British were in control and they weren't going to have Indians around, or dogs. They're in the same category. Now the Indians see it's their turn be running the world. So there is this change in expectations. That's a key factor in the acquisition of wealth. When you think it's your turn to be rich, you will start to draw wealth into your life. We see them having rising incomes. There is improved health and education and, of course, increased status of women. Always a key factor now for modern development. When women improve their status in society, the country gets a rapid development. So these are some of the indicators that we're seeing now the return of Asia, not the rise. And let me just, as a final introductory comment, make uh, some observations about the new American administration. When I was here before, we were still looking forward to the American election. We now know the result. Barack Obama still globally enjoys a pop star status. I was in the American, sorry, I was in the Australian tally room for the election. Uh, in November when the results were coming in. And uh, I think that of the people in that room in Sydney, 70% would have voted for Barack Obama at least. So he enjoys this incredible status around the world. He's not nearly so popular in the United States. Um, now there's a sense of disappointment in the, on the left uh, of American politics, but also, of course, the right have objected to him right from the outset. For a start, they don't like the idea of a black man running America. That's not his role. This is a white person's country. It's 
very worrying to see that gun sales are reaching new record levels in the United States, fed on the back of rumours that Barack Obama is going to ban gun sales. He won't. He can't. But nonetheless, the words got out. In some American states, they're now rationing the sale of bullets because they can't produce the bullets fast enough for the consumer demand. Very worrying, the number of people are turning up at the healthcare rallies this month carrying guns as part of their opposition to the new Barack Obama healthcare uh, proposals. Meanwhile, many left-wing American supporters are already disappointed that he's not making that much progress as, he was, as they were hoping for. For example, he's not going to investigate many of the errors of the Bush administration. All sorts of crimes were committed by the Bush administration for eight years. But we probably are not going to get a full investigation of those. So we see a situation, therefore, where the Democrat politicians are now moving to the right, and the right are moving into the mental hospital. <laughs> Let me turn now to the state of play in regard to conflicts. The democratic theory of peace still holds. This is the idea that democracies don't go to war against each other. Despite the impression that we give in the media, because you guys like wars and we give you wars, the world is becoming a more peaceful place. The chances of your being killed in a war are less now than they would have been a hundred years ago. People have moved from being subjects of monarchies to citizens of republics, and now they're global consumers. Subjects, or citizens, used to expect military glory from their governments. So the job of Napoleon was to go out and win wars. Now, increasingly, when we want national glory, we look to sporting teams. They represent what's good, noble and true about Australia. That's also the reason why sporting personalities have a new status in Australian society, or British society, American society because they are the true heroes for us today. Unfortunately, some sportsmen have not yet recognised they do have this new status vis-à-vis -vis the uh, role that they play in society. But we now look to governments to provide economic and social growth, not warfare. We don't want them going to war. So what we're seeing then is a reduction in the appetite for war a belief that we want to live a more comfortable life. We don't want our children having to go off to war. Also, a wealthy middle class leads to democracy. An authoritarian regime can govern a poor peasant society, but a wealthy middle class want to say in how society is governed. Those of you who studied psychology will remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You work your way up with your basic needs of food, shelter and clothing, and you're reaching this top of the pyramid called this point of actuality, whatever that is. But what is interesting is that we see in places like Taiwan, South Korea, uh, even Indonesia, that as societies have got richer, so they have th overthrown the author authoritarian rulers that they had, and they have become democracies. In the case of Taiwan, for example, the outgoing uh, vice president of Taiwan was, the, was a female, Annette Liu. She is the most senior woman elected in 5,000 years of Chinese history. So we now have democracy, at least on that island. It's yet fully, of course, to come to mainland China, but it will do so. There are now more democracies in the world than ever before. And the world is gradually becoming a safer place. The worst time for being killed in a war in the past 109 years was that period 1900 to 1950. That's the Korean War. From 1950 onwards, we've had a reduction in the number of people killed in wars. Similarly, Asia overall is now more peaceful than it has been for many decades. For example, China and Russia have avoided the war that the veteran American journalist Harrison Salisbury predicted 40 years ago. He, said that he wrote a bestseller called The Coming War Between Russia and China. Um, and that's where we thought the next big war was going to come. Hasn't happened. 
and Russia and China are now, in fact, improving in their relations. Terrorism, however defined, is a problem, but it should not be overestimated. I think one of the biggest criticisms that the Bush administration will get from history is that it overestimated the issue of terrorism. We have so many other military problems around the world, so many other problems generally, but Bush focused too exclusively upon a very small number of potential threats to Americans or Australians or whoever. Wars are now only very rarely international conventional invasions. There is a problem with localised conflict, not least in our own region, such as the Solomon Islands, East Timor and Timor-Leste, and I'll return to that point later on. But the basic point I want to get across is that the world is becoming safer. Fewer and fewer people are being killed in wars. The world is becoming a safer place, despite what we do in the media, because you guys like war, and we give you the wars. Well, let's look at the two most well-known wars from an American or Australian point of view, Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, foreign forces have now been largely withdrawn, including most Australian, not all, but most Australian forces have been withdrawn from Iraq, and Iraqis are now having more say in how they are governed. Localised violence continues and will do so for some time. You see, Iraq is a pre-modern state. By that we mean the modern era begins in Europe. International lawyers give a particular date, 1648. That's the beginning of the modern era. And that's when we invented what is called the nation state. So some countries are obviously a little older than 1648, England and China. Others are much newer. Germany redraws its boundaries every generation. But basically, the nation state system means you have a nation of people, homogenous speaking one language, one flag, one set of history, and then a state which governs it. Iraq, the problem, let me just say with Iraq, is that there are very few Iraqis in Iraq. The problem is that you have in Iraq still this pre-modern era of people whose loyalty is, will be to the local tribes or clans or families. Iraq has yet to undergo a change in consciousness. You see, here in Australia, we might have jokes about the rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne or between New South Wales and Queensland, but at the end of the day, we're all, we're all Australian. In Iraq, that's not yet the case. Iraq is pre-modern. The problem for President Bush is that he didn't understand the complexity of the country into which he was moving. Clearly the invasion of Iraq in 2003 will be seen as a new era in modern politics, but not possibly as President Bush expected. See, the basic, one of the basic issues in that part of the world is a dispute that's gone on within Islam for the best part of 1,200 years. It's between the Sunni and the Shia. Now, Iran is principally Shia. And the Iraq is principally Shia. But when the British invented modern-day Iraq, remember, after World War I, the British moved into that region and they took over from the, what were the, top, the Ottomans, the Turks, and Winston Churchill, the colonial secretary, said, all right, we'll put together three lumps of territory. We've got um, what is present-day Baghdad, that's in the middle, and we'll put it a bit at the top and a bit at the bottom. And we've called that Iraq. So Iraq is a modern entity. It's not the traditional entity that you'd know from the Bible. So they invented this thing called Iraq. The majority of the people in Iraq are actually Shia. But the British don't like the Shia. Nobody likes the Shia. They go around as the working class, chip on the shoulder Muslims. The British don't like dealing with them. They're more fundamentalists, they're more difficult to deal with. So the British then looked around for an unemployed king, who was a Sunni, and said, well, you're not doing very much at the moment, come across and be king of Iraq. So they then imposed a king on Iraq, who was a Sunni. In due course, he was overthrown and was replaced with still more Sunnis. And so we've had a string of minority Sunnis all the way along since the 1920s. Originally monarchists, 
now Republic. Saddam Hussein was a Sunni. And so what we've seen then, in the year with 2003, President Bush talking about one person, one vote. The rest of the Arab world thought the man was mad. One person, one vote means that Iraq becomes a majority controlled Shia territory. You are handing Iraq over to Iran. Saudi Arabia could not agree to that and therefore did not support the 2003 invasion. They did help in 1991 with the liberation of Kuwait, but they were not going to help in 2003. They opposed it. The Arabists in the State Department were advising President Bush, don't get involved in Iraq. He ignored all of that. You know, he believed that you know, the rest of the world is like Americans. We all believe in democracy. Just insert democracy into the country and it will all be well. My own feeling is that eventually Iraq will become a democracy because we see this tide of democracy sweeping around the world. But it's not going to be inserted from the outside. You've got to go through this period of economic growth. You've got to be able to create a middle class. Ironically, there was one there for some years. You need to have this middle class. And then in due course, that middle class will say, we want to run the country. But you can't insert it from outside, like the Americans have tried to do. So I think the jury is going to be out for a long time before any assessment can be made of whether the 2003 invasion by the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia was a smart move. There's no doubt, however, that in terms of engendering anti-American feeling worldwide, it was clearly an error. It's led to an increasing amount of anti-American feeling around the world. Iraq, according to the democratic theory of peace, will eventually become a fully-fledged democracy, but only according to its own schedule and its own economic development. And a stable, flourishing Iraq will make a great contribution to global output. Meanwhile, as we know, in 2003, the Israelis were saying to Bush, forget about Iraq. Saddam is saying it's not a problem. The real issue is Iraq and its desire to acquire nuclear weapons. Remember, we almost sold them uranium in the 1970s. It's always been a long-term Iranian policy to have nuclear energy, potentially nuclear weapons. So we know the Israelis were saying to Bush, forget Iraq, Iran's going to be the problem. My guess is that Iran will continue to be a problem for us. Let me turn now to Afghanistan. Originally, the invasion of Afghanistan was seen as a good campaign by most Australians. Um, Barack Obama, for example, who opposed the invasion of Iraq, as did a majority of Australians, did nonetheless support the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Remember, that was done to kill or capture Osama bin Laden and to destroy his Al-Qaeda group. We now know, by the way, from the memoirs written, that the instructions given to the Americans uh, going in in 2001 was not to capture Osama. We don't want to have him put on trial. Make sure he's dead. We can't afford to have the guy go on trial and reveal what he knows about the support that's been given to him by Saudi Arabia and the United States over the years. So I've actually used the phrase there, kill or capture, but we now know that the instruction was actually to, to kill, not bring him back alive. Don't put him on trial. But it is interesting, nonetheless, that after eight years, there is far less support for all of that. Um, there's a feeling, I think, that the, the, Afghanistan is a bit of a failure. After eight years of work, we've actually got very little to show for it. Meanwhile, the Western death toll is increasing. Britain has now lost, for example, more soldiers in Afghanistan than in the war in Iraq. And we have yet to develop an exit strategy. One of our basic problems is we're still no longer sure about why we're there. Was it to get Osama bin Laden? If it is, well, he's not there. He's in Pakistan. So what are we doing in Afghanistan? So I think Afghanistan is continuing to be a problem for us. Let me look to Australia's region now. There is a new definition of security. Security was traditionally defined narrowly, essentially as military matters. But now it's seen more broadly based and going beyond defence. It includes economics, environmental protection, health, etc. Notwithstanding all these old problems of 
defining what we meant by Australia's defence, there was a sense of comfort that at least the regional status quo was favourable to Australia. So while we had this debate amongst the academics like myself as to what do we mean by national security, national defence, at least the region overall that we looked at, at least since 1975, was fairly stable. And Australia had a dual strategy. On the one hand, we had a special relationship with the United States. Australia is the only country to have fought alongside the United States in every war in which the Americans have fought in the 20th century. And of course, we began the 21st century with that record with the invasion of Iraq. So we've been very loyal to the United States, more so than the Canadians, the British or the French. That was one strand. The second strand is that we were improving our links with the emerging Asian Pacific countries. So that was called the dual strategy. No matter who was in power in Canberra, it continued. Indeed, you can look at our foreign policy and you don't notice any differences for when there is a change of government, when Labor comes in or when the, the Liberals come in. Now there is concern that the regional status quo is ending and that Australia and the region are now moving into a new era. So the old era was one of, which for example goes back to Gough Whitlam, Prime Minister, uh, 1972 to 1975. He used to reassure Australians about Australia's geographical lack of vulnerability. As you know, Australia has this collective fear that we're going to be invaded. It's on the front page of today's Australia. More asylum seekers are coming into Australia. A couple of hundred. There's an illegal person, or legal person, entering the United States once every 18 seconds. I teach at American University. They cannot understand why Australians are neurotic about asylum seekers. 200? We get that in a few minutes. Anyway. That's deep in the Australian psyche, the fear that the rest of the world is going to fall down into our corner of the map. <laughs> Gough Whitlam tried to reassure Australians about the sheer size of Australia, our lack of vulnerability, and the fact that our economy was bigger than the immediate region's total combined. Now, the geography hasn't changed. We're still very isolated from the rest of the world, but Australia's economic status vis a vis the rest of the region certainly has changed. For example, in the, the mid-1960s, when we had the confrontation with Indonesia, Australia had, the, Australia had the wealth and American contacts to outspend Indonesia on advanced technology. That competitive edge no longer exists. We are no longer bigger than the rest of the region combined. Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia are growing. So that region now overshadows us. What I've done under number nine is simply to list a whole series of trends to keep an eye on. I, as you'll see there, the trends all suggest volatility, but the changes are not flying in the same direction. So there's a sense of confusion uh, about what is going on. Remember I'm emphasising all the way through this presentation, we're moving into a period of great change, even our, in our immediate region. The old idea is about our being strong, that we, would don't, we were the superpower of this part of the world. That is beginning to change. So let's very quickly run through some of these new factors. One is that this is probably the first time ever in Asian history that so many players are simultaneously wealthy. So many of the other countries in the region have more wealth than ever before. This is the end of the regional order created at the end of World War II in 1945. There is plenty of scope for what is called functional cooperation. This is the good news. So functional cooperation is when you cooperate with health, environment and crime. For example, we've got better relations with Indonesia on crime now than ever before. But there are also many unresolved, deep-seated regional disputes that could provoke conflict. For example, border disputes. The Spratly Islands, a group of islands that are pretty well uninhabited, but are sitting on very oil-rich area in the South, well, I was going to say South China Sea, but even the, the geographical location is subject to controversy, but potentially very rich in oil. As regional conflicts become richer, so they have more money to spend on defence, and the Prime Minister has even referred now to a regional arms race. It's quite weird. As you get richer, so you spend more money on defence. It's a bit like an ordinary Australian. As you get richer, you move to a bigger house. If you're a country, 
You get more money, you spend more money on defence. There's no logical reason for it. There is now not a sudden threat to Singapore or China, but simply that as your economy grows, you naturally spend more money. There is a declining military role for the United States, and in fact, as I've already indicated, a debate over whether the United States is now in a terminal decline. Remember, the British didn't notice that they were in decline in the 1930s. So it's a bit like a person with dementia. You don't notice that you're going out. Um, the British didn't notice they were declining. Maybe the Americans don't notice that they're declining. It's a psychological challenge for the United States to move from an elite hub and spoke strategy. In other words, America is at the hub and it deals bilaterally with a number of countries, Australia or China or whatever. That's the old style. Now that's no longer the case. A lot of countries are dealing amongst themselves. It's mutual multilateralism, not the American elitist hub and spokes approach. We've got the rise of China and India, or return of China and India, and their capabilities. They're moving now into what are called blue water navies. A brown water navy is when you've just got a little navy to protect your own coastline. A blue water is when you can send ships a long distance. If you go to China, you'll see that their history books claim that the Chinese went out to discover the world in the year 1421. Those of you from coastal Victoria, that shipwreck which is at Warrnambool may not necessarily be a Portuguese boat, it could be a Chinese one from 1421. They certainly reached East Africa in 1421. We now see for the first time since 1421, Chinese warships off the coast of East Africa. This time they're fighting the pirates of Somalia. The Chinese are back. They've been away for 600 years, but now they're back. We've also got the gradual rise of intergovernmental organisations covering this region. For example, keep an eye on the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. The two principal members are Russia and China, and some of the other smaller countries in the region. The Americans asked to join, and they said, sorry, this is not for you. This is just for the big boys. <coughs> In June of this year, at their summit conference in Ekaterinburg, in Russia, they looked at the question of whether they should push for a, uh, to drop the American dollar as the global reserve currency. So keep an eye on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It also shows that such organizations are no longer a European monopoly, like the European <coughs> Union and NATO. And warfare has now moved from being symmetrical, for example the Anglo-German naval race a century ago where the countries matched each other in acquiring battleships, we're now asymmetrical, where a large country can be defeated by a much smaller one or a terrorist group, such as said we've seen in Afghanistan. Also China's IT skill could result in disrupting the United States command and control system and so deny the US's intelligence superiority. In other words, the Chinese could blind the Americans by wrecking their spy satellite system. Finally, Australia has only a limited influence in pressing for new regional security architecture. It is no longer a major player. It used to be, but this is not so much because of an objective decline in Australia, but because of the comparative rise of all the others. So there is really a new era opening up in Asia. We are no longer the dominant player that we used to be. Let me just conclude, because I'm running out of time, let me just conclude with uh, drawing to your attention the issue of technology. There is yet another revolution underway, this time in technology. The argument has been that we've had essentially three major revolutions in our human history. First was when we stopped being nomadic, the hunter-gatherer society, such as the indigenous peoples who would have lived in, the, in these swamp lands where we are at the moment. And we, where the first revolution was the farming revolution. So we made money out of farming and agriculture. In 1750, the British invented the Industrial Revolution. Factories, remember this is coal and iron again, to which I referred earlier. So the factory revolution has gradually encircled the world and has reached now China. The third revolution is now underway. It's information and communications technology. Just look at your hands. Your hands are not the hardened hands of farmers or coal miners, and they're not the hands of factory hands. 
Increasingly, we are all symbolic analysts. The symbolic analyst spends a lot of their time during their day on the telephone, and they can't describe to their children what they do for a living. <laughs> Forty-five years ago, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, predicted that the power of computers will double in every 18 months to two years and would halve in price every 18 months to two years. This doubling power in 45 years, this doubling power is really beginning to kick in. There's a story about the invention of the game of chess. It's got 64 squares. The emperor was then to reward the inventor with giving a grain of rice for the first square, a grain of ri two grains of rice for the second, and just keep doubling for 63 times. If the emperor had honoured his promise to the inventor of chess, he would have to plant the entire surface of the earth twice over, including the oceans, to grow that amount of rice. That's the doubling power, and that's what we're seeing now with computers. Number 11, I've just got there the impact of the information economy. A fish doesn't know that it swims in water, so the full impact of the information economy may not be fully recognised by those of us who are living through this revolution. Now, let's give you some good news. Just as the world fears the impending global calamities, for example climate change, so humanity saves itself by creating a global brain to bring people and ideas together. We call that the internet. So maybe the internet is our escape route for generating the new ideas. The internet connects more people, dissolves national boundaries, creates global hits, such as Harry Potter or Susan Boyle, <laughs> compresses time, creates new markets, and matter no longer matters. So what is important now is what's in the head of your staff rather than what's actually within the factory itself. There are greater options for the consumer, so ideas can move rapidly around the world. We have created a new global economy and a new global culture. For example, in China, 300 million people have been lifted out of poverty in three decades. Number 12, I deal with some of the opportunities and challenges in this new era. If you're interested in this, Ian Ayers has written a very good book on super crunches about how anything can predict it. Now, it's, it's got nothing to do with improving our skills as statisticians, simply the power of computers. For example, in the United States, uh, if you gamble at Harrah's casinos, Harrah's casinos, you go in with a little card and you swipe the card in all the locations. There's a giant computer that's monitoring wherever you go in the United States on their gambling tables. Everybody has a pain point. As a good Methodist, mine's $5. Kerry Packer was probably at $5 million. The computer works out when you're reaching the pain point, when you have donated so much money to the casino for the evening, and then it alerts a customer liaison officer to come and stand beside you and offer you a free meal at the restaurant. So you then leave the casino having had a free meal. You've just paid a huge sum of money, in my case $4.99 uh, for that free meal. So that, that's all in that book, Super Crunches. I'm conscious I'm going to get the, the wind up from the chair. Let me also just draw to your attention the whole issue of mobilising science for health, the pioneering work of Kevin Warwick at the University of Reading, who is now implanting chips into human bodies. For example, chips in monkeys have enabled the brain to get over spinal cord injuries, and eye limbs are now available on Britain's national health system. So you get a, a hand that will, can be guided by your own brain. It's an artificial hand. We will probably be the last generation to die with no foreign intelligent parts in our body. At the moment, some of us have got unintelligent parts in our body, <laughs> hips and knees. But eventually, we, when I say eventually, I'm talking about 10 years, we will be able to insert into your brain an automatic capacity to learn, say, French or German. That will be intelligent parts in our body. We will have computer chips to enhance our thinking. One of the most interesting inventions is passion jewellery. So you'd wear a bit of jewellery, which is a Bluetooth, when you've worked out who your ideal partner is. And then as you get close to your ideal partner, 
it changes in colour. <laughs> now, the problem is that it may well be your ideal partner is looking for somebody else. <laughs> Let me just conclude now with a warning. Let me just enough of the humour for the moment. Let me just get on to something which is particularly for those of us in the age group of most of us in this room, which is the right to die debate. We've seen a social change that's come about since the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's been the end of the deferential society. Remember, the deferential society is women deferred to men, young deferred to old. So if you're an old man, white man, you were the top of the castle. Now individuals have got a greater sense of self-reliance and individuals no longer like being organised. The baby boomers, those people born between 1946 and 1966, are social inventors. They are active, unpredictable, wealthy, and they will continue to make their own rules. Remember that when we were teenagers, like all teenagers, we were interested in sex, drugs and rock and roll. Now we're getting older. We're more interested in superannuation than we are sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> But we are the ones that drive the pace of change. We are the largest single age cohort in the history of the Western world. The warning that I'm giving is that baby boomers will force on society a reconsideration of the right to die. At the moment, as you know, it's illegal in most societies around the world for people to end their own lives with assistance. You obviously can still commit suicide. By the way, that used to be a criminal offence in Australia as well. You can commit suicide, you can't help somebody to commit suicide. My own feeling is that we will reach a point in the next, I think beginning in about perhaps 20 years, even less, when you will find baby boomers saying, I've had a good life and now I'd like to have a good death. Particularly if the alternative is dementia. If we haven't got a cure for dementia in 20 years, there will be an increasing demand for people to be able to uh, say, I now want to have a good death. It's interesting to note that Sir Edward and Lady Downs, Sir Edward Downs is known to people in Sydney because he conducted the first orchestral concert at the Sydney Opera House. He put the Sydney Opera House on the musical map, globally speaking. And Sir Edward and Lady Downs were getting old. Uh, they could not receive any assistance in dying in Great Britain, which is where they've lived in retirement. And so they journeyed across to Switzerland, where there is an arrangement. And that's where they died. We've had a case in Western Australia of a person in an aged care facility who has wanted to be able to refuse treatment. And the Supreme Court in Western Australia has accepted that there is not an obligation on the part of the staff to force feed their resident, thereby allowing him to die. So what I'm doing then is simply to highlight for you that there is some good news coming up in terms of medical technology. Tremendous breakthroughs in terms of what we can do, but I think there's also going to be a lot of controversy over the issue of the right to die. Baby boomers, who are mostly our clients at the moment, like to be able to control their own lives. They want to control their own superannuation. They also want to control when they're going to finish life on earth. <laughs>